Uh, welcome everybody and uh, welcome to you, Sonia. I hand on over to you. Sounds great. Thanks, Camilla. Um, great morning or evening to everyone. Um, so I think you should just introduce our panelists here. Uh, so we have Martin Ekthe, uh, who's the Trade and Invest Commissioner um, uh, for Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. Uh, Martin, do you want to say a few words? Um, my name is Martin. I'm, um, I'm our, actually our, not only a Swedish uh, Trade and Invest uh, Commissioner, but I'm also Business Sweden's Global M&A Lead. So uh, we're based here in Sydney, but we work and engage with a lot of clients across the globe in terms of m and deals. Good to meet you all. Great. Um, and Ken, we've got here, who's a partner at EQT and set up their operations there in Australia. Cool. Thank, thanks, Sonia. Uh, as mentioned, uh, my name is Ken Wong. I'm a partner and head of our Australia and New Zealand business um, at EQT Partners, which uh, many of you probably know is is a Wallenberg founded um, investment fund listed in, in in Sweden or headquartered in Sweden uh, and op operating for over 27 years. So good to meet you, everyone. Awesome. Um, and then we've got Jonas Bergqvist, uh, who is a partner at the law firm Magnussen uh, in Stockholm. Uh, good morning. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, nice meeting you all. Yes, that's correct. Corporate M&A partner at Magnussen. Uh, we are a full service law firm covering the Baltic Sea region with offices uh, around uh, uh, the Baltics. So it's a pleasure joining the webinar. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Thanks. And then finally, we've got Warren Campbell, who is an angel investor, uh, early stage and also an Antler Venture Partner in Stockholm. Thank you, Sonia. Hi, everyone. Um, I think many of you I've met before in similar sessions. Uh, as Sonia says, uh, early stage investor, I spent the last five years uh, investing in uh, early stage tech uh, type businesses in the Nordics. Um, before that, McKinsey partner, and I was actually founder and CEO of a, a business of my own. Uh, I'm also chair of the Australian Business Council. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Um, great. So to kick it off, Martin, um, maybe you can kind of set the scene a little bit and introduce us to, to M&A and go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Well, let me just share my screen. So give me a few seconds. Great. Thanks. All right. Perfect. Excellent. It works. Uh, good. Well, well. Um, I was given the opportunity to just uh, introduce m and and uh, m and is something I'm extremely passionate about. Um, like I said, I'm Business Sweden's global m and lead, and sometimes when we meet clients, they don't normally understand what, you know, Business Sweden, why are we engaged in m and But if you think about m and as one part of the equation, if, if we look at growth, I mean, our <clears throat> our goal is to achieve growth for Swedish uh, companies uh, on an international scale. So you have both organic growth and inorganic growth. So it becomes a very important part of that equation. Um, and what's interesting now, and I would like to kick off with, a, with a, an innovation of to decide. Now it has become a necessity for incumbents, a differentiating capability needed for long-term success. And I think this is extremely important nowadays. Um, historically, when we looked at M&A, it was more scale uh, M&A. And uh, the strategy was, you know, how can we expand? How can we reach economies of scale, et cetera? These days, it's much more complex when you look at m and It's much more diversified. So we have scale. That's still important. Obviously, we need to enhance the profitability. We need to reach economies of scale. But at the same time, we also need to invest for the future. And we need to be prepared for the digital decade, et cetera. So it's, it's a very interesting um, uh, time if, you, if you're interested in m and um, I also started off by looking at some historic figures, and as we can see in this graph, you know, this, this basically the bars uh, showcase uh, the deal value generated on a global scale by M&A. And what we can really see is that, yes, if we, if we compare 2019 and 2020, the deal value decreased somewhat with 15%. However, if you look at the, the long trend, it's very clear that you know the last 10 years the deal value has increased by 17 percent if you go back all the way to 2001 the deal value has increased with 75 percent so m a is increasingly becoming a vehicle 
for companies who want to achieve growth. I think that's important to keep in mind. If we also add another filter to this graph and we say that, okay, there's been a few crises. Uh, I mean, we have the tech bubble, 9-11, we have the financial crisis, and now we have ongoing COVID-19. What's interesting from our perspective is that we can clearly see that after, there is a, after the, there's been a crisis, there's generally a reset in the market. So that generates a new business landscape. A new business landscape um, entails you know, new customer preferences. It entails new business models. Uh, it entails a lot of things that companies need to address. So normally after a crisis, we'll see actually an upswing in terms of deal value and deal activity. So <clears throat> what we think and what uh, is basically that we will see this uh, going forward as well. So yes, the deal activity has dropped somewhat from 2019, but we anticipate and we forecast that it will actually um, kick off. So each crisis has, has basically generated um, a new business landscape and uh, kicked off a springboard for M&A activity. If we also look at another perspective, and I think um, there's a clear shifting point of gravity on a geographic level, and it's really interesting if we start from the left hand side 2006 and we move to 2019 and we look at the black part of these bars, we can clearly see that you know activity in, in our region, APAC region, has increased from 11.6% to 19.3%. And if you take into account 2020, so yes, we had a decrease, but what actually we saw was that um, in increasingly a shifting to APAC. So uh, 2020, APAC constitute 26.4% of the total deal value. So it's really significant. And I think this is something that we will see uh, further on as well. Um, not only because Asia Pacific, as we all know, it's, um, it's the engine of global growth, uh, obviously, China plays a big part. Uh, we clearly see these days that China is, is uh, trying to restructure its economy, and as we see a lot of consolidation uh, in China with you know Chinese firms. We also see, as we all know, there's a growing number of attractive tech targets in the region. We see uh, a lot of competitive uh, ecosystems and startup scenes. You know, we have Beijing, Shanghai, Tokyo, Singapore, and even Sydney. Uh, Melbourne, uh, et cetera, are also increasingly becoming more attractive uh, when it comes to um, tech and innovation startups. Um, we also see a growing uh, inbound volume of M&A activity into the region. So I'll come back to that in a moment, but we do clearly see that other regions, you know, companies with head office outside APAC are increasingly investing into this region. So uh, 2020, 26.4%. That's you know the, of, of the total deal accumulated over the years. So it's, it's clearly a, a shift towards uh, APAC. Um, this is just an exhibit. I mean, this is something that we normally try to convey a message back home to Sweden when we talk about APAC as a region. On the left hand side, you will see you know, the global share of uh, of uh, of uh, GDP. 190 to 2019 and it's paints a very clear picture i would say that you know you see you know apac as the outlier achieving substantial growth and if you move to the right hand side of the picture we will see that you know the share of net gdp growth at the same time it's actually a, a very telling picture so apac is clearly the growth engine um, for global the global economy from a Swedish perspective, uh, I've chosen to include um, this slide. Um, like I said, we are trying to convey the message back home to Sweden that you know you need to focus more on this region. If you look at the Swedish exports, only 12% during 2019 uh, went to Asia Pacific. That's clearly not good enough, you know, when, when you think about the, the, the previous slide I just showed. Um, at the same time, we do see that a lot of Swedish companies have been successful in establishing their business in the region, so accumulated in the region. So that's, that's obviously better than 12%, but it's still, we think that there's, there's more um, to, be do, uh, to be done here. 
If we just turn our focus to Australia, I think we had probably the worst timing when we released uh, five strategic imperatives for continued success in Australia. We released it mid-February last year. Uh, but I think one key thing that it's, it's worth highlighting is that we've seen this trend in the market for uh, a few years now. And Australia is uh, typically overlooked when it comes to um, tech companies or in innovative companies. And, and we see that there's a large and, and actually growing innovation scene in some key industries, such as agriculture, mining, and cybersecurity. However, um, we also see that there's, as we all know, um, there's a lack of OEMs in the Australian market. So that's something that we believe is uh, a void that, that could potentially be filled by Swedish companies. So we definitely want to stress that target investments into the Australian market is, is actually something that uh, is worth pursuing. All right, so coming back to um, uh, the broader picture and, and some, some trends. Um, so some of these trends, they were already present and they were already happening pre the crisis, but I think they have been further accelerated by the COVID-19 crisis. So if you start from the left, government play uh, a growing role in M&A these days. Historically, it's been more about um, uh, competition, et cetera. Uh, these days, it's much more driven by a country's strategic assets and capabilities. So we see cases like you know, the Lion Dairy uh, acquisition uh, in Victoria in Australia that was you know, put on hold or actually put off. We saw TikTok's US operations being a debated topic. So the ability to veto foreign hostile takeovers uh, in key or in sensitive industries are increasingly becoming more um, um, relevant and, and is something that M&A practitioners need to take into account when we, when we do global deals. Um, we also see that deals are continuing to become more local. Uh, this is basically a reverse globalization. I mean, we see the trend um, companies need to have local and regional supply chains. Uh, they need to improve their resilience. Um, and this is clearly something that we will see continue. So we, we anticipate more local and regional M&A going forward. Um, and sustainability. This is, of course, some a trend that we've seen, uh, you know, for the past few years. But when we look at M&A, this is, you know, we see a growing customer awareness in terms of social and sustainability uh, considerations. And a lot of companies are now, or they have to uh, see these, uh, these solutions as more of a competitive advantage. So that's why we see more and more investments and acquisitions um, uh, from companies trying to enhance their sustainability um, portfolio and offering. Um, I've also wanted to highlight two additional uh, trends, and I think these are really interesting. And I'll, I'll deep down, I'll double click on these two in, in a minute. But divergent fortunes across industries. Clearly, we've seen through, during the crisis that there's been a lot of winners and losers, uh, and and the outlook in terms of sectors have greatly varied. So we will see a consolidation in, in and, and divestors in, in the industries that have been heavily affected by COVID-19, for example, the airline industry. Uh, but we also will see a continued capability build up in sectors uh, within which competition is driven by innovation. So we obviously you have technology, media and telecommunication, et cetera. So that's something to look out for. Uh, and also, we see a growing appetite for scope deals. And what, what do we mean by scope deals? Well, I, I briefly mentioned scale deals being you acquire a company, you want to reach economies of scale, you want to have synergies, or typically cost synergies, and, and um, in order to be more profitable and, and in order to grow. Um, scope deals are, are um, a different type of M&A. So with scope deals focus on more uh, acquiring new capabilities, uh, expanding top life growth in terms of um, trying to acquire a competitive advantage or redefining a business by gaining new capabilities. So these two is, is really something that we uh, see uh, will shape uh, the M&A uh, agenda going forward. 
And if we just start to look at the different industries, uh, the winners and the losers, what we've seen is, you know, the <clears throat> technology, media and healthcare, these are some of the market capitalization change uh, from 2019 to 2020. And we see that there's a huge shift uh, and, and a lot of discrepancies in terms of which sectors have achieved um, uh, or, or been viewed uh, by investors as being more attractive. I quickly mentioned scope and, and scale deals. And on the left-hand side, you'll see all the industries and the, basically the percentage of scope deals. So starting from 2015 going to 2020, we see that scope deals are gaining momentum. Um, at the same time, if we shift and look at technology, the technology sector, we see that in you know, 2015, 44% uh, of all deals uh, was being viewed as scope deal, meaning you're acquiring new capability, you're acquiring innovation, you're acquiring uh, something um, innovative. However, 2020, within the technology, that number was up to 81%. So, so clearly the trend is very clear. Uh, scope deals are increasing and uh, supporting the trend that companies are expanding into new and fast growing segments uh, by acquiring new capabilities. Um, I also want to come back to, I mean, the first graph that I showed uh, in terms of, you know, the deal uh, value and what we've seen. And if we look at, this is basically 2018, 19 and 20, uh, the global deal value per quarter. And I think it's very interesting to see that, you know, when, when the crisis hit last year, there were very few companies that were willing to make uh, buy or sell decisions. So basically, the whole M&A market just crumbled, and 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 be you know extremely few deals. However, what we've seen is that during Q3 and Q4 in 2020, we saw a major upswing. So we obviously easing liquidity uh, had an impact, but we also saw that you know companies were starting to be willing to invest, um, and they had to. Uh, have to invest as well. So clearly an upswing, and I think um, we, this trend will continue into 2001 as well. Just wanna leave you all with, with another quote. Um, and I think it's very interesting. Uh, As the world locked down and masked up m and endured. And I think this is, uh, just clearly tells the picture, yes, it's been a crisis. A lot of companies have, you know, in, in a few months cocooned, but at the same time, the need to acquire uh, new capabilities and move into new fast moving segments have, you know, have really increased. Awesome. Right. Thanks so Thank much, you. Martin. Great overview. Um, great. Well, I mean, speaking about the ma market bouncing back, I think I'd like to start off with Jonas. Um, how's the Swedish market performed during the pandemic and what factors do you think has attributed to Sweden's resilience? Uh, thank you much, Tony, and thank you very much, Martin, for that introduction. Uh, it is interesting to see how very similar sort of the situation is in Australia as in Sweden. One would have expected perhaps uh, larger differences on a global scale, but to a to, to large extent, I would say that uh, at least my view of the Swedish market is more or less a blueprint of, of uh, uh, what, what you just presented. We have seen, uh, uh, I think for everyone, surprisingly high level of activity in the M&A market for, uh, on, on a full year basis for 2020. Uh, of course, Q1, Q2, uh, a drastic uh, uh, decrease in, in the level of activities, but uh, a substantial bounce back uh, Q3, Q, Q4. And I think that one of the things that have attributed to, to the sort of resilience in, in Sweden has, of course, been that we, we, we have not experienced any, any large scale national lockdown. So uh, although a lot of uncertainties have been in the market, uh, many companies have been able to continue to, to conduct business more or less as usual, given the circumstances. Uh, another thing I th uh, think it has been, been, been very positive for the level of activity has been, been the, the um, 
readiness for the operators in, 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 in Sweden, for, for the investment community to adapt to the new circumstances. Uh, we have seen a drastic increase in the use of uh, digital means to conduct uh, uh, transactions. So, uh, and, and this is also so what I hear uh, in the street that, that we have had the, the development in, in MA when it comes to doing it at distance has been, been you know, pushed forward uh, several years, in, years in, in, in a very short period of time. Uh, so, so all in all, I think you know uh, a, a very sort of swift uh, adaptation to uh, the, the the circumstances has, has really worked to the favor of continued uh, decent levels of of M&A activities. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, guys, I'm going to ask some more questions. Obviously, feel free to put some questions in the chat, and I can pick them up a bit later. Um, and, you know, Jonas, you mentioned that Sweden obviously didn't have a, a proper full lockdown. Um, Ken, you're based in Australia. Um, you guys have obviously had a lockdown. Um, have you experienced any difficulties in doing M&A deals during the pandemic? Um, I, I think Jonas's point is, is very similar to the point, even though we've had lockdowns. I, I think people have um, learned to adapt to, um, to do due diligence remotely using zooms to do management presentations I, I think the entire i think it's a consistent um shake up that the pandemic has caused or uh, opened up people's minds of, of conducting due diligence and MA transactions um remotely you know i i literally just had a, a data room open the other day where the within the im was contained 3d imaging of, of, of going site by site and that's a new technology that i hadn't seen before where you could literally walk through each each of the specific sites had, had links to about 50 or 60 sites. So we've used the virtual data rooms. Now we're used to virtual site visits, uh, virtual management presentations. Um, I, I think we've all come to accept that, that the pandemic is, has, has, and through the use of technology has changed the way that we will potentially do deals um, going forward. Great, yeah. Um, and I mean, from a PE perspective, you know, how does the market look like for private M&A or versus going public as well? Yeah, I think I think also really interesting, and I think this is a global theme, uh, particularly when I when I chat to my colleagues globally. Um, the markets are red hot everywhere. Uh, I don't think there's any market that is not going through the through the roof, and and that's both in in private M&A transactions, so whether it's it's private equity or whichever investment class. Uh, ventures and the like, there is so much capital out there. Um, low interest rates are also just mean just mean that the, the appetite to, to buy anything at, at right now, it's pushing push, pushing asset prices up, but also people are chasing um, chasing any any deal that is remotely um, yielding any sort of cash dividend because right now interest rates are zero or negative. It, it just the, the appetite to deploy is is huge. It also applies to public um, um, IPOs, and we are seeing uh, a flight to quality. I guess to, to Martin's um, slides of where deals are, are particularly active: healthcare, TMT, things that have proven a resilience post um, COVID. There has just been an enormous flood of money going into them. So both listed markets, but also companies looking to IPO. You know the valuations that. The banks are offering um, companies to IPO if you are in a COVID beneficiary market is, is through the roof. And, and TMT, we're seeing that with, you know, the fact that we're having this conversation on Zoom, whose share price has gone through the roof is, is, is case in point. But both private markets and public markets, valuations are, 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 are red hot. Okay, interesting. And I mean, we're talking about, you know, M&A and then that side of it. But if we go kind of more early stage, um, Warren, what do you see in terms of, you know, Europe and, and what are like some hot areas that you think are coming up now? Uh, I lost the end of your question, Sonia, but I, uh, I, I think I get the gist. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to kind of say the same thing again. I mean, it is a very similar picture, I would say, in early stage investing in terms of uh, huge activity, kind of record level valuations. Um, things have bounced back very quickly. Um, a year ago, I was doing a few of these type of discussions, and we were looking back to the analogy of kind of 2007, 2008, the financial crisis, and we saw kind of both volumes of deals, size of deals, value of deals go down significantly. And we we're sort of saying, 
we're probably heading into a similar kind of period now in 2020. Um, you know, that, that things froze somewhat in Q2 and then Q3 and Q4, we've been back to, to record activity. Uh, so that definitely hasn't happened. And um, I, I think the, I think in the early stage investing, what we're seeing is one, yeah, a proliferation of new funds with a lot of capital to, to deploy. So, you know, in a sense, they haven't had time to wait, but there has also been, just been an incredible amount of exciting disruption uh, and disruptors who hadn't really found their product market fit, who have been able to step into a void where the incumbents have been less active during kind of lockdowns and dealing with crises in their kind of existing business. And the, uh, the startups and, and the smart scale ups have taken a bunch of market share and space there. So uh, definitely booming. And I guess I'd echo the same trend things as well. I mean, in Europe, there is a huge trend around sustainability um, driven by all sorts of factors, kind of consumer sentiment, the, the global, I mean, obviously BlackRock and, and other investors who have started to send very clear signals in terms of where they want to see money uh, moving to and moving from um, the whole Greta Thunberg effect up here. Um, and the EU very strongly sending signals both that they will punish companies who are not making a kind of you know a climate transition, but also rewarding and supporting those who are. Um, I think we're seeing some very clear trends there. Great. Okay, interesting. And um, and then I think if we go back to you know talking about PE funds now, you know especially investing in in tech companies. Um, Ken, I mean, how do you guys future proof your portfolio companies for the pandemic? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question and, and it's an increasingly important question. Um, and it's something that we at ETT have, have been thinking about for quite some time. So we, we think of future proofing our companies with, with two lenses. Um, the first is, is in a sustainability, well, in, in terms of an ESG sustainability lens. And that's that's always been the heart of, of EQT's DNA right from the start. You know, we we you know we have a our motto is literally to, to future proof companies and, and make a positive impact um, in, in everything we do. And that's 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 our modern um, uh, mission statement. But back in the day, it used to just be more than capital. But it's it's that consistent trend of what we've always been we've been focused on. And, and so the sustainability, it's, it's finding good companies and helping accelerate. Um, uh, how we we as investors can drive positive change from a sustained ESG perspective. So, moving all of our portfolio companies to 100% renewable, gender and broader diversity on our boards as well as our management teams. Each of our portfolio companies, we set specific KPIs which we track and monitor as importantly as we track and monitor financial performance. So, by the end of our ownership journey with those portfolio companies, they need to be leaders. In sustainability they also need to be leaders in, in a digital perspective and so we very much have uh, focused on bringing in-house digital capabilities into our um, into our ecosystem we have a ventures fund which part of the reason we, we started our ventures fund was, was specifically to ingest or bring in-house some of these capabilities or access to digital capabilities so that when we are setting the long-term strategy of our portfolio companies we we also have a digital lens in which we want each of our portfolio companies to be the, um, the digital champions in their respective industry. Um, and we think it's super important that you can't just have a good five-year strategy to make, you know, the, you know, be the market leader. You also need to be a digital leader because it's important now, but, but roll forward five to 10 years, it's only going to be increasingly important. And post pandemic, that's, that's even, that, that statement's probably even more true. Yeah, definitely. Um, great. And I mean, in terms of like foreign buyers, um, do you think that there's any scrutiny for foreign buyers or, or you know, in the Australian market at least? Yeah, that, that's definitely, um, I, I think Australia is unique um, in terms of it's been leading the charge with, with some of the national security concerns around data, telecommunications, health, um, all of that. You know, Australia through the Five Eyes network and being one of the um, one of the um, key contributors in that has has led that, uh, and so national security interests are, are super important. I think that it, it's it's something that's something that uh, foreign investors certainly need to um, be mindful of. I'm I'm optimistic that switch companies have a much easier time to invest in in Australia um, because of. The fact that you know there are so many Swedish companies with a long history 
of investing in the Australian market, but I, I think national security concerns have absolutely increased and it's something that I think anyone coming into the Australian market or anyone investing in the Australian market knows and is aware that, that it's something that they need to consider as part of any investment, uh, which sectors they're going to focus on, how they're going to approach it, how are they going to deal with health data, telecommunications data, personal data. I, I, think, that's, I think that's increasing. I think that's probably also the case in most other countries as well. Um, I can't imagine that um, most Western countries right now are not super focused on, on that area. And I mean, I'd love to ask Jonas you the same question, um, if there's any scrutiny for foreign buyers, but from Sweden perspective, especially as a lawyer as well. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is indeed a an, an highly relevant question. And historically, Sweden has been, been extremely uh, open to foreign investments. Uh, but lately, and I think very much also driven by the COVID-19 and the sort of fears that came along with, with, the, uh, with the low prices on the valuable national assets, uh, that there has been, been uh, uh, several uh, legislative processes uh, driven uh, in, in Sweden. Uh, basically, two uh, uh, two ones. Uh, the first one driven by the EU regulations on FDI, uh, and and then the second one that quite rapidly was adapted, actually, uh, which has introduced additional uh, scrutiny of foreign investments uh, that 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 came into effect first January this year. Uh, the exact outcome of that regulation is still unclear, but but it may, basically, you know, it goes to 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 increase the possibility of, of uh, uh, imposing restrictions on foreign uh, investments. But uh, needless to say, this will add to, to sort of uncertainties when it comes to, to uh, foreign investments into sensitive areas such as uh, infrastructure, such as health, healthcare, and, and, and uh, of course, there also the traditional ones that have been, been, been subject to scrutiny, uh, such as military activities and so forth. But, but yes, I, I, I perfectly agree with, with, with Ken that this, this, is, you know, this is something that is in play for, for, for everyone coming uh, to Sweden now, now also to, to, to do investments. So we will monitor this very closely closely to, to see where, where it ends up and we have had some some uh, real examples of it re recently also with the Huawei's uh, 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 business in Sweden when they tried to, to participate in the auction of the 5G net uh, so, so um, yeah it, it is there and, and, and hopefully we will gain some more clarity uh, short, shortly on that there is a special investigator, uh, investigation ongoing to sort of define in more, more clear terms exactly how this should be, be interpreted. Okay, yeah. Um, and I mean, what are some of the common issues that arise with companies when they commence their M&A projects in Sweden? Like, what do you see, I guess, on a daily basis, maybe? <laughs> Yes, I mean it's um, uh, th 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 this. This is a question that's uh, difficult to answer in <laughs> in, to, in in a short uh, version. So, so, uh, uh, but I can try to to give some examples that perhaps could be of relevance for Australian uh, investors coming to Sweden. And and as a starting point, of course, uh, uh, Sweden offers a significant degree of contractual freedom. So, so th this one should should uh, you know consider coming here. Uh, you don't require any specific contract or forms to 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 uh, to purchase uh, shares in Sweden or purchase assets in Sweden. So so it's 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 very it's very open for the parties to discuss the forms. Then of course we have adapted to to the globalization of everything and, and more or less adopted the the the, the Anglo-Saxon way of doing M and A with the uh, standardized uh, SBA formats more or less. But then it could also be worth uh, uh, to, 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 to note that uh, we, we tend to prefer doing share deals uh, in, instead of asset deals. Uh, it it um, uh, adds to, to, to the flexibility of, of the, the parties doing the, the transaction. In the same way, you, you rarely see mergers being used as, as a mean for the transactions. Uh, uh, Another thing to consider is that at least when you when you have larger transactions, these are basically driven through controlled auctions. 
I suppose it's the same thing in Australia, but, but it's worth mentioning some, some foreign investors are not used to, to, to this format, but, but this, this is a uh, common place when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you look at the, at the larger transactions. Another thing that could be worth mentioning is that, that the, if we just talked about the FDI regulations that, that are coming to effect, but apart from that, there are very few uh, requirements of regulatory filings or approvals, except of course for antitrust and so forth. So it's, it's a rather smooth process coming as a foreign investor to Sweden, uh, I, I would say. Uh, we don't have any transfer taxes payable for transfer shares. Uh, and lastly, perhaps I can mention also that sometimes comes as a surprise to foreign investors that there are no re public registers of share ownership. So this is a responsibility for each and, and, and every company. So it's worth keeping track of that. And then we have these share certificates that tend to sometimes uh, cause a bit of a trouble because as they are better of rights in relation to the shareholding, you need to keep track of those and make sure that you have control of them. Quite often they are lost and you need to, need to manage that in a good way. But apart from that, I think, you know, what, 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 what should be expected is that you have uh, buyers and sellers in Sweden that are very used to working in a, a global environment and that has, has sort of adapted to the, 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 uh, uh, the Anglo-Saxon way of doing, doing M&A, at least that is my view. Okay, interesting. But, you know, deeper into that, like, which M&A agreement clauses do you think face the most negotiation or scrutiny? Um, and, and is this any, like, you know, sort of change that has happened because of COVID or, or is it kind of similar to what it used to be? So I think I missed the first part of that question, but, but it Sorry. related to, to, to changes in the, the, uh, in the M&A deals uh, post-COVID yeah. or... Yeah. Mostly like the, you know, is there any certain clauses that kind of face the most scrutiny? Yeah. Yes. I mean, of course, uh, the the the, uh, the the structure of the uh, of, of the pricing is, of course, a uh, question. The the, uh, uh, the 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 if you have an earn out or if you have a fixed price, uh, always subject to 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 a lot of discussions. Uh, um, definitely, the 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 warranty catalog is warranted reps and warranties are always discussed to 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 a, a large extent. Uh, so I, I think that th this is this is typically uh, uh, in line with what what, what is uh, expected in in international deals. Uh, in general, you wouldn't find any sort of specifics for the Swedish market uh, in, in that area. Uh, I think so. Okay, interesting. And I mean, uh, since we're still on the, you know, kind of Sweden side of it, Martin, do you have an idea of, you know, what are some M&A opportunities that you see in Sweden as well? Um, well, thank you. Um, well, I mean, if, if we look at Sweden, um, we have a lot of interesting companies, in particular within, you know, OEM, you know, original equipment manufacturers. I mean, the companies that with a strong engineering background um, uh, that have been you know very successful on a global scale already uh, these companies they are increasingly trying to um, expand into new uh, verticals so going forward and i mean we have already seen this in, in numerous uh, instances i mean going forward these um, large global companies they are increasingly trying to build new capabilities uh, build new technical capabilities they are also increasingly trying to um, tap into um, regional and local ecosystem in order to become more local or more domestic and if we look at australia as an example uh, I, I shared some export figures on a global scale but I mean, if, if you look at Australia, and this is something I normally mention, Australia is Sweden's fourth largest export market outside um, of EU, which is obviously significant, only beaten by uh, US, China, and Japan. So it's, 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 it's significant. At the same time, and what worries me here is that a lot of Swedish companies is treating the Australian market as a sales market. They, they have sales offices, they've been successful over numerous of years, but they don't really participate in the ecosystem or local ecosystem buildup. So that's something I would see more of going forward. I would, I would also um, 
anticipate a lot of these companies to invest more heavily into some of these key markets, just in order to be viewed as more local and also to be, become uh, competitive uh, in the coming decades as well. Just being a sales office uh, it will not um, work going forward. Okay, yeah. Um, and I mean, Ken, if we go back to, you know, the question of, we had it in Sweden, you know, what are some of the common issues that arise when companies commence their M&A projects in Sweden, but what about Australia? Is there any difference there? Uh, no, again, I feel like given the globally connected way that deals operate, I think they're, they're similar. I think some of the, the causes that, you know, Jonas mentioned in, in terms of, you know, constructs and deal constructs, it's, it's very much the same. Material adverse change clauses are probably one that got a lot of scrutiny at the height of um, at the height of, of the crisis. But uh, it's the, the same points that have been raised. I don't think Australia is is particularly unique. And I think hearing some of the other panelists, I think that's a key theme or key message that I I'm certainly getting out of this conversation that we can be on the other side of the world. Um, but I think from an M and A perspective, the same issues, the same trends are universal. Um, whether this side of the world or, or, or the other. Yeah, okay. I guess the pandemic has helped us become very digital, right? Exactly. So, great. Um, and in terms of like, if we talk about like opportunities, um, like Warren, do you see any specific opportunities for like the Australia or Nord like with Nordic's um, ecosystem? Hmm. Um, the, the one I, I mean, there are several, I think. I mean, two areas that I, I definitely see is the whole energy transition uh, is an opportunity, maybe manifesting itself in slightly different ways. I mean, if you look at the Nordics, the Nordics has, has been leading for a long time in terms of you know, technology development, early adoption of uh, renewables, et cetera. So we have a pretty advanced already kind of wind uh, ecosystem. Etc. But then you also see, because of the energy, because of the industrial background that kind of Martin was alluding to, kind of Sweden has has been quite uh, at the cutting edge. I would say in terms of you know Europe's first uh, battery, green battery effort with Northolt. Um, we see green steel, kind of two different initiatives in Sweden, kind of pushing the the envelope on uh, carbon free steel. Uh, CO2 free steel. So you kind of see in Sweden the innovation and the push coming from the industrial end. I think in, in Australia it's very interesting to me as an old energy market uh, person from Australia that basically what Australia seems to be doing is mobilizing all the experience they have from kind of LNG value chains and financing mega in, uh, kind of energy and mining projects and very quickly mobilizing around renewables and hydrogen to build the same kind of value chains to supply the rest of the world. Um, and I think that is an area where kind of the combined, if you could find ways to combine the competence from the uh, further forward in the value chain in the Nordics and combining that with what's happening in Australia, I think there's some really interesting opportunities. Um, and I think another one is health. Obviously, uh, Australia in many ways, and I guess EQT have been involved in that for quite a long time, but uh, there's, there's a lot of health innovation and the ability to provide health services from Australia into Asia. I think Sweden for various reasons has been actually very early out in terms of finding digital ways to address primary care with kind of the, the players like Tree and Min Doctor and various others. Um, and I think the, the whole COVID pandemic is, is pushing both, you know, in terms of the older population adopting digital tools, in terms of needing to find ways to work remotely in health. I think there's a bunch of kind of things that are leading to a tipping point where there is a real opportunity to disrupt even more in health. And I think um, that is an area where Australia and, and Sweden, I think, could clearly be collaborating and, and innovating and doing investments in each other's startups to, to find opportunities that you could deploy in, in either direction. Uh, just two, two areas that I see. Yeah, super interesting. I mean, personally, as a consumer, I've loved these, <laughs> these companies that have come up, right? Um, Cool. I mean, we have some really great questions in the chat, so I'm going to pull up some of those. We've got one from Ben. Um, the deal flow is increasing, especially in technology. However, is there any evidence of improvements in the success of M&A in increasing shareholder value? Does anyone want to take a stab at that? Maybe Martin? 
Um, yes, well, thank you, Sonia. Um, I think it's very interesting to hear Ken uh, address this question as well. But yes, well, I think it's very clear that, I mean, looking at some of the uh, market uh, valuations uh, that's been going on here for, you know, 2020, that, you know, investors have clearly valued the companies that have been in the forefront that have already started the digital journey. And, and the companies that have been late on investing into mm -hmm. technology are actually being punished uh, and they are scrambling to um, um, to come back into the game. And I think we will see, I mean, in the coming five, 10 years, the companies that are not investing into new technology in, in order to be, you know, digital, digitalize their offerings or become more sustainable, et cetera. I think they will be um, uh, punished not only by investors, but also by com consumers. So there will be uh, a clear shift. And I think this, COVID crisis has only accelerated that trend. Yeah, I think it's I think it's too early to tell uh, exactly you know the what the um, whether there has been a significant increase for shareholder value, um, whether it's a long term structural increase for for specific segments of technology, both in actual investments in in technology within companies themselves, but also in you know, technology subsectors um, and investing in, in actually technology companies. So I think it's, I think it's still too early to, to tell, but I, I think, um, I think the, the point where everything is heading towards is that if you, it's one of those uh, table stakes items to be invested in technology, but also investing in technology companies, um, because I think the post pandemic, they will be more important subject to valuations. And that's always a risk. Um, that you get caught up in, in I guess, lofty valuations that can obviously erode shareholder value. It's um, uh, it's too early to tell, but I, I think it's it, it's it's certainly going to be very. It will be interesting to see, I guess, whether long term shareholder value is created by um, by this in the future. Our our view is certainly it will. If you pick the right winners, invest in the right technology, then you 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 will you will create shareholder value. But quite frankly, it's probably a little bit too early to tell. Yeah, great. Um, and we have another question in the chat from Xavier. Um, so how are investors dealing with high valuations in areas like cloud software? Has skepticism increased since the beginning of the year? Um, maybe you can take that again, Ken, and then we can hear from Warren from an early stage perspective. Yeah, I think so. I think it's regardless of whether it's a cloud software, I think every industry is experiencing um, super high valuations. And actually, a couple of years ago, that's we used to say the exact same thing. Uh, we used to have a common theme that we thought valuations were high two, three, four, five years ago. I think we've been saying it for the last 10 years. Uh, so every time the valuations keep on going up, um, we are always. We were, I guess we have we have a similar question. Um, I think the way that the way that investors and investors who are going to be around in the future need to deal with high valuations is that you can no longer rely on multiple arbitrage to, to create value. Ultimately, you need to have tangible value creation initiatives that are actually going to drive proper value in company. You cannot just rely on the free money that's floating around. Um, I think that 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 risk of not creating value for companies um, and therefore as being an investor, being having sub subpar returns will only increase because interest rates can't go much lower. But yes, they can go more negative, but it it is, I, I think we are, we are seeing that the contribution of investors and what value they bring to the table has become more important as a result of, of, of high valuations. To the, to the second part of that question around skepticism around certain sectors, I think absolutely, I think people are, um, you know, there's this hype in, in some of those markets and I think it just comes back down to due diligence. So what are you actually investing in? Is this, is this hype or is this reality? Is, is there a structural reason why companies should be trading at a higher valuation? Is there a structural reason why the growth prospects of the companies that you're looking at um, better as a result of or post COVID. So um, it's a complicated question, um, but it's 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 on the valuation side. Absolutely, you need to be more focused on value creation, and I think picking the right winners and, and truly understanding who's a who's a beneficiary or who's who's coming out of the other side of COVID 
um, is, is a key part of a due everyone's due diligence when they're investing in the current environment. Warren, we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Mm. <clears throat> no, and, and I mean, I actually think Ken has described pretty well what the dynamic is in early stage investing as well. I mean, if you kind of take an example, kind of software as a service businesses, um, you know, a year ago, uh, probably trading at, uh, you know, valuations were kind of 10 times uh, annual revenues, and that felt expensive, right? And right now, they're probably at 20. Um, so, you know, valuation, and, that, and the same occurs in a bunch of uh, startups where there is some kind of a, a clear um, advantage coming out of the, the COVID situation. Um, and, and I think, you know, is, is that causing people to hesitate? Yeah, you kind of, you definitely look twice and think about this, um, but there is a lot of capital to be deployed and people have an incentive to invest. So investment is still happening. What I would say is, I mean, it's the same point Ken made, but in the early stage end of the market, there's much less to do diligence, right? Because Often, the, often there isn't a lot of operating history. You're going off sort of a fairly short period of unit economics, whatever. I would say what it means is that there is a flight to quality in terms of looking at the founders, looking at the team, looking at the setup around them. And I, ironically, kind of what you end up with is I think valuations for the really good companies that you believe can actually build this organically and kind of grow into the valuation. Um, those valuations are even steeper because it's kind of in the early stage game, that's the only real definer of success that you can, you can find. So the market is a little bit binary, I would say. Um, if it feels like a so-so a, a team and they're a bit too early, then people are hesitant just because the valuations that the founders expect are anyway pretty high. And then like, I mean, because of the increasing deal valuations, do you think that it's say more difficult to, or unpredictable, like as to what they're gonna be? or what the founders think they are? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think in the Nordics, one sign of that is that you see right now an awful lot of um, convertible loan uh, safe type mechanisms where you in essence are putting off the valuation until a subsequent round um, because it is very difficult to motivate kind of a valuation based on current performance with the expectations that founders have based on what they're seeing in other transactions of slightly later stage companies. Sure. Um, great. I mean, we have a couple minutes to go. I would actually like to go back to Jonas. I know we've kind of asked you, Warren, the question of, you know, what are some of Swedish business sectors or industries to watch, um, you know, this year and next year, but I'd love to hear Jonas's thoughts. Well, I think that this, uh, thank you. I think that this has been quite um, uh, uh, covered in a good way uh, by, by the other panelists, uh, but, but of course, uh, uh, what will be interesting seeing is is uh, uh, the the uh, the effects of the, uh, the 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 green initiatives at the EU level uh, post uh, pandemic and see see what opportunity that brings. Uh, we are of course also having a very sort of vibrant fintech scene that that, that offers a lot of opportunities for investments. But apart from that. Uh, very much energy related. Uh, it was mentioned the the, uh, the green steel initiatives and the various uh, possibilities in that area. So 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 th this is definitely you know uh, what I would expect could, could provide good opportunities uh, in 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 Sweden uh, uh, the, the the next few years. Um, renewables, uh, energy, uh, fintech, uh, and is anything TMT actually uh, would, would probably be, be, be a good possibilities. Great. Um, and I mean, in terms of like, you know, what do you see any positive indicators for the Swedish market and like the mid to long term? Well, I would say that that uh, they are all there more or less. I mean, the the most common uh, phrase that I hear uh, go to, to to these webinars these days are there are a lot of dry powder out there. So 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 everyone's just looking for 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 new investments, and of course, I mean this is sort of. The, the the positive thing uh, that, that, that 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 made it possible for us to to maintain uh, reasonably high levels of MA activities during the last year will continue to 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 have a positive impact on continued activities as well. I would say 
so, so, and this together with being fairly developed uh, 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 on, on the digital side, uh, also uh, many companies having really sort of uh, uh, embraced the importance of ESG that, that we're all seeing becoming more and more important will create, you know, uh, a, a good, a good sort of starting point for, for, for further uh, business activities here. Yeah. Okay, awesome. I mean, I think we're kind of out of time here, but um, thank you so much to all the panelists. I think it's been a great discussion. I think we've gone through a lot in just under an hour. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone's learned something. Um, we obviously have more events coming up with the um, uh, Swedish, uh, Australian Business Council in Sweden, um, and of course, SAC as well. Um, not too sure if Camilla, you want to mention any particular ones? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you so much to all the panelists and, and also to all attendees. Uh, yes, we are really lucky here in Australia as uh, it's opened up more and more so we can now have uh, in-person events. And we actually held an event with 106 people last week. It was a golf event with all the Nordic uh, chambers based here in, here in Australia, which was very successful. Um, our next up and coming online event is, uh, uh, an, uh, is about artificial intelligence and that's organized by our young professional um, committee and that's uh, held on the 18th of March uh, at 6.30 Sydney time. And, uh, and that's uh, the presenting at this event is the AI center uh, in Gothenburg in Sweden. So that's our next uh, online event. We have a few uh, events which are coming up as well. So keep an eye on our website. We will be organizing an event in Brisbane, which is a, a scale up event. We had, uh, and to the end, towards the end of last year, we did a startup event and we're having a follow up scale up event happening. That's gonna come up on our website shortly. Um, that's an in-person event uh, and we are trying to make that a hybrid event as well. A lot of our events, we, event now are, uh, we are aiming to uh, make as hybrid events where possible. Uh, in Melbourne, we are very uh, excited that uh, Ambassador Sedirin, who has joined this webinar uh, as well tonight, is uh, visiting and we will, in conjunction with his visit, organize an event for all the uh, SAC members there. Uh, in Perth is also happening, uh, events coming up, and in Sydney we also have a few networking events which will be posted soon on our website. Another thing I might mention as well is that uh, the Swedish Chamber has also now started up a sustainability committee, and within this committee we will also have uh, events which we also coordinate together with uh, Swedish Chambers in Asia Pacific, their sustainability committees as well. Uh, and just to mention the companies who are involved in the committee is um, Volvo Group Australia, we have uh, uh, Alfa Laval, we have IKEA, Tetra Pak, H&M, ABB, AstraZeneca and Yetinge in the committee now, uh, as well as, uh, of course, Team Sweden, which is um, uh, represented by the Embassy of Sweden and Business Sweden and, and SAC, of course, in, in the committee as well. So, uh, so that's really exciting. And uh, the, uh, we will shortly announce more information about the comedy as well with a, a release, which is coming up soon. But that's all from me. So thank you very much. Uh, I don't know uh, if AB, uh, AB um, uh, CS would like to mention a few uh, words as well, Elena or Sonia. Uh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, I, I'm so jealous that you guys have in-person events. <laughs> Definitely not a thing here in Sweden still, um, even though it's kind of open, it's just freezing. Um, but uh, I mean, we have obviously go to our website, uh, australianbusiness.se. Uh, we've got a couple of events coming up and we've got our annual general meeting this month as well um, and we have a really fun online game uh, called The Trip. Uh, one of our board members has actually has the company that is uh, organizing it so definitely try and come on to that. 
Um, and then we have one next month um, with uh, an Aussie over here that it will be talking about uh, entertainment industry um, and basically how to make uh, films for Netflix and TV series. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Sonia, for moderating. <laughs>